the song ended before I got up here. You know it's a CAS event when we started with Magic System, right? Let's, let's hear it for DJ Uju. And also, yes, this is that kind of event. Welcome one and all to the first in-person and also virtual Center for African Studies annual Centering Africa lecture. It means the world to us to gather in community to center Africa and the diaspora and learn together how that very centering shifts our frames on questions of AI, ethics, and building other better worlds. If this is your first CAS event, welcome to the family. You will always find a community with us. This may not feel like your usual formal event, and we hope that is a welcome shift. May we reflect together and maybe even share some dance moves at the reception. Events such as this appear like magic, yet many hands have shaped and made possible this day. We are indebted to cast directors, Dr. Cabrita and Dr. Sita, and the director of Our Very Horizons, Brenda Mutuma. Exactly, more of that, more of that. We pause too to thank every CAS student program coordinator, the incredible folks at the Alumni Center, our friends at Coupa, and event services. We too acknowledge CAS community members from the School of Engineering, particularly the support of computer science and MSNE. Our partners at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence have been cheerleaders in arms with us from day one, and a special shout out to the incredible Celia Clark. That's right. Our fabulous friends at Stanford Seed, the Stanford Humanity Center, the McCoy Family Center for Ethics and Society, the h and Dean's Office, the Digital Civil Society Lab, Science, Technology, and Society, and the Producing Knowledge in and of Africa Workshop have all pitched in with hearts and hands. We are all grateful to be part of this with one another. Before we begin, a bit on centering and its powers. Today's event centers an incredible alumna whose commitment to mentorship, ethical scholarship, and advocacy inspires us endlessly. Today foregrounds two, the voices of CAS students who constantly change how we imagine the politics of the possible. The discussion today will be among these brilliant scholars and facilitated by my co-host, the incomparable Ms. Carolyn Asante Darte, CS and AI genius herself, the creative director of CAS and holder of our hearts. As we listen, we may reflect on how these very centerings reframe our assumptions about AI, ethics, and the nature of knowledge production itself. May we find our questions reshaped, our hopes bolstered and unbound, unfurled, and our intellectual community made ever more vibrant and more full of solidarity as we insist on these very centerings. I hand this podium mic now to my incredible co-host. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Carolyn, and I just want to thank you all for joining us again today. It is my honor to introduce the wonderful Leah, who will be introducing our speaker. Leah is a sophomore majoring in management, science, and engineering, and a dedicated member of CISA and CAS. Please help me in welcoming Leah to the stage. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Um, thank you all for being here today. <laughs> Thanks, Tim Neat. Um, it is really beautiful to see all of your faces here, and this lovely weather definitely adds to that. But um, as you guys have heard, my name is Leah. I'm a sophomore studying management science and engineering. And today, I have the immense honor to introduce our very special guest and alum, Tim Neat Gebru. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Tim Neitz is the founder and executive director of the Distributed Artificial Intelligence Research Institute, also known as DARE. And here, she and her team work to develop AI that is centered in values of equity and public interest. You may also know Tim Neitz for her prior role at Google, where she co-led the ethical research team. And here at Stanford, she received both her bachelor's and doctorate in electrical engineering. Pretty impressive. <laughs> Outside of co-founding the organization Black and AI, being on the board of Addis Coder, a nonprofit dedicated to teaching computer science to Ethiopian high schoolers, and being named as one of the world's greatest leaders by Fortune, Tim Neitz is also an advocate and change maker amidst the Tigray war in Ethiopia. And not to brag, she also happens to be my aunt, and I actually didn't know this until about two years ago, but ever since we have connected, Timmy has been a mentor to me. She has shown me love, support, guidance, and she's also showed me the ways that I can harness technology as an aspiring engineer, not just for profit or financial stability, but as a way and as a tool to empower individuals, communities, and organizations alike. Timmy is changing the future of tech. She's inspiring hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals across the globe, and she never fails to light up a room. It brings me so much joy to know that our CAS community has this special opportunity to learn from her genius and to hopefully continue making progress on the path that she has plowed for us today. So please make a very warm welcome for our special guest, Timnit Gebru. Hi! I, I love being here because um, this is very different <laughs> from, from uh, the venues that I usually um, talk at. So, um, so I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, and it's cold, it's not cold, but I wanted to wear this jacket because I, I need to show off some of the um, stuff I'm wearing from the continent given the, the venue. So uh, here is my jacket from uh, Zambia, if any of you are from there. But, uh, but I'm gonna take it off because it's warm, it's too hot. Um, <laughs> this is from, uh, from Ethiopia. So I got this from Ethiopia. Uh, this is from Etra. Uh, my shoes broke and I taped them so that I can do this. <laughs> um, this is also from Zambia, and I believe this is um, this is from Minnesota, but uh, made by a Somali woman in Minnesota. So I wanted to represent, um, and thank you so much for having this space. I think that building these kinds of spaces for us where we feel comfortable dancing, for instance, while we're talking about technology and um, science, is part of the work. So thank you so much for welcoming me like this. Um, before I uh, get to my talk, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Tigray, which um, Leah mentioned. So today, I'm going to donate my, uh, the honorarium that I get, the generous honorarium that I have from, from this event, to a joint fundraiser that Tzadale Lama, who is uh, the founder of uh, a news uh, organization that's called Addis Standard. So I highly recommend if you want to know news about Ethiopia. Um, so Tzadale and I are uh, organizing this joint fundraiser for Tigray. So I want to um, talk a little bit about uh, you know, you can go read our fundraiser, it's on GoFundMe. I don't have the link right now, but I want to talk a little bit about why we're doing this. So um, there's nothing that can describe the agony of watching 7 million people experience the severity of death in slow motion. And yet that is exactly what every day is like for those 7 million Tigrayans besieged inside the Tigray National State in North Ethiopia due to what the United Nations called a de facto blockade. Um, for 18 months, we have tried to raise global awareness 
um, using our voices about Ethiopia's devastating genocidal war on Tigray. Now we want to up our support by raising funds. So we are partnering with an organization called Tagaru Disaster Relief Fund to uh, fundraise. So our goal is $30,000. I think we've, we started this fundraiser yesterday and we've already raised about $15,000, um, which is great. So thank you to everybody who donated. And so we're gonna be matching $7,000 in donations. So that's where I'm gonna be donating um, any honorariums that I get from any, any of these events. And so our um, fundraiser is um, sp uh, specific, especially to three areas that are um, close to our hearts, um, women, healthcare, and education. So um, they, a recent joint report by Tigray Bureau of Health and Metlala University revealed that a shocking number of more than 100, 120,000 girls and mothers were subjected to horrific sexual violence. Um, according to, a, and in healthcare, according to a recent con, um, study conducted by Ma'ala University, the civil war has decimated 80% of hospitals, 78% of health posts, and 72% of health centers in Tigray. And um, 3.9 million people need health services, services and interventions. And in terms of education, the latest data by the UN shows that more than 1,000 schools in Tigray that were damaged by the Civil War were left uh, an estimated 160,000 students without their right to education. So um, Leah mentioned a decoder uh, where we, um, by the way, I'm not from Tigray, but you don't have to be from there, I think, to um, advocate for the people of Tigray and, and realize how horrible what's going on is. And so my students, at Addis Coder, who are from Tigray. I haven't heard from them. I don't know if they're alive. I don't know if they're eating. I have no idea where they are. And our TAs um, had to, some of them had to flee. Some of them, we don't know where they are. So this is a situation I just wanted to, I couldn't do this talk without um, saying a little bit about what is uh, weighing heavily on my mind uh, day in and day out. Um, okay, so with that, I want to talk to you about, a little bit about D.A.R.E. and um, why I started it um, and what we're hoping to accomplish. So this is D.A.R.E. <laughs> it stands for the Distributed Artificial Intelligence Research Institute. Uh, we didn't want to call it D.A.R.E. because that is not, we're not about D.A.R.E. Um, you know, but so D.A.R.E. <laughs> it's the acronym still D.A.R.E. And um, this is where you can um, follow us. And I wanna talk about our values. And, and this is really um, at the root of why we wanted to start it. And you don't have to try to read, read this stuff. I'll just um, tell you what it is. So DARE is an, um, uh, an independent community rooted um, artificial institute uh, to do research on artificial intelligence, right? So that means both kind of um, doing the research in a way that's not exploitative um, of our communities, and I can talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but also uncovering the harms without persecution, right? I couldn't do that at Google. I tried to uncover the harms, look at what happened, right? I'm not gonna dwell on it, but so I'm hoping that we don't have to do that, I dare. Um, and so, and the first word that came to my mind uh, when I when I was thinking about creating this institute was the word distributed, right? Um, and why is that? It's because these large tech companies, or even Stanford, when you look at the amount of power that is concentrated in this place um, and how it's impacting the entire world, but the entire world doesn't get the opportunity to impact it. The entire world is not getting an opportunity to impact the way tech is de being developed. And I, I saw this firsthand when I was at Google. Um, the last person I hired, poor guy, El Mahdi, um, he is Moroccan, and two weeks into his uh, time at Google, I was fired, and then another three months, uh, his next manager, Meg Mitchell, was fired. So that's, that's Mahdi, but he had been trying to raise awareness about the issues of social media um, in Morocco, for instance, and to no avail. Right, like how journalists were um, being targeted, et cetera, his friends who were journalists were in jail, to no avail because it's not in the US, right? Um, and so how can we 
talk about ethics or um, responsibility or whatever when we have these companies who can say, hey, sorry, I don't care about Morocco because, you know, who, who's going to do anything about Morocco? Like, you know, there's not, nobody's going to go up in arms about what's happening in Morocco. So for me, it's very important to, to have, you know, some local actions, but have still have a much more um, global view. So um, I also didn't want to contribute to the brain drain, right? When we talk about how much power is, just, like I said, um, um, centralized here, if someone is living in Atlanta, and they want to work on AI research. I don't. I want them to stay in their communities and support those communities. I don't want them to have to move to San Francisco or Silicon Valley or whatever. And same, if someone is in Nairobi and they want to, um, they want to work on this space. I don't want them to have to to move. So that's the whole uh, point with the word distributed, and that's why the the first thing that came to my mind was distributed. Now let's talk about the values. Um, so, you know, I've been in this rabbit hole of. Uh, fairness, et cetera, um, and ethics, and all of these things that we talk about for a long time. And I've tried to do a whole bunch of things. Like, I've tried to attack the problem in many different directions, right? So when I went to conferences and I couldn't, literally can't, you know, uh, see another black person for miles and miles on end, we started in Black and AI, where, you know, now you can go to one of these conferences and you can feel that you're not the only one. You can have a dance party, which we do, all the time. So if you are in a machine learning or AI related conference, you go to Black and AI, let me tell you something, we have the best dance party. So, <laughs> so you know, um, I tried to do the community building stuff. I wrote, a, you know, research papers on un auditing and uncovering the harms. I talked about documentation. Um, I, I talk, you know, I did work in math. You know, what, are, what, what, what does it mean to be fair? What are the kinds of metrics we can use mathematically, etc. But really, <laughs> what I realized is, we can talk about ethics or fairness or whatever, all we want. But if the institution doesn't allow for this kind of work, it's, 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 it doesn't matter, right? If you try to do go a, a specific direction and you can just get fired, if workers don't have rights, so I'm very pro graduate students unionizing, let me just put it out there. Yeah, <laughs> because if you're gonna go talk about ethics, you wanna do research differently, et cetera, and then your advisor is going to control your whole life. You're going to be too scared. You're not going to push back. So for me, at the end of the day, we have to talk about institutional changes, institutional structures, and how is it that we want to build our institutions. So the fact that I have um, this opportunity to do this from scratch means that I get to think about how do we want to build this institution. So that's kind of where I am right now. I'm thinking much more about institution building. And so when we were talking about this institution building, the very first thing that came to my mind about um, our values is community, not exploitation. Why? Because research, especially AI research, is a very exploitative process. You think about why so many places are um, rushing for automation. It's because they think they're going to get more profit, but if they were paying a living wage, they wouldn't. Um, all of this data that's being collected from people without payment, Right, so, so this exploitative process and who researchers extract knowledge from, like a lot of indigenous people talk about this, right? Indigenous communities talk about it, this uh, parachute research. And this happens a lot in the African continent. I grew up seeing it, where people who are not from there swoop in, do want to do international development or whatever, swoop out. And who gets the fame? Who gets the money? Who gets the fortune? It's not the, the people in there, right? So that's. Um, community, not exploitation, was the first thing that came to our mind. Healthy, thriving researchers. Like, this might sound weird, like everybody should be <laughs> healthy and thriving, right? But I wanted to explicitly put this in our, in our values because what I see around me in the field of AI is everybody stressed out. Everybody needs to chase the next deadline. How are you going to be doing something ethical if you're chasing the next deadline all the time? So we need, to, we need to make sure we maximize, we, we uh, think about people's health and people's, you know, peop I want my researchers and my institute to be healthy. Um, and then the next one is comprehensive principle processes. What does that mean? You, you know, we want to do research slowly. And if at any point we get to a point that says, 
we actually should not put this work out there. We actually shouldn't um, do this. I want us to be able to do that. And we can do that because we're not going to be needing to chase the next paper, the next publications. I'm not trying to get tenure or whatever. So that's, 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 that's why we can do these comprehensive principled uh, processes. Finally, proactive pragmatic research. So the thing we say is that AI is not inevitable. So um, I really like this um, comparison by Chris Gilliard, right? He is a professor in Michigan, and um, he said that, you know, People don't say, when we found out asbestos is bad, we just said, let's ban it, right? We weren't like, well, it's inevitable. It's everywhere now. Like, how are we going to get rid of it? That's not what we said. But a lot of times when people talk about technology, AI, that's what they say. Well, it's inevitable. It's going to happen anyway. It's not. So when we find issues, we, can, we have to say we can, we can ban it, right? Like face recognition used by law enforcement. We can ban it. Why can't we? Just because it's out there doesn't mean that things can't be differently. So this proactive pragmatic research means that, okay, if we want um, AI that benefits our communities, what kind of processes should we follow? And at the same time, if we see something that's harmful, we should be able to say no, right? So these are our four values. Now let me tell you about, uh-oh, oh, sorry, the people. Um, and uh, this is the founding team. So we have Alex, who is director of research, Dylan, Raseja, Mehron, uh, Mila, and Safia Noble, and Shira. And I wanted to highlight them because of um, like my belief that people should bring their whole selves to uh, work, right? So Mehron, for instance, is our new newest um, research fellow. And Mehron is a refugee advocate, right? She's not an AI researcher. She's someone who's helped more than 16,000 refugees in the, uh, in the Sinai. Um, she has a documentary called Sound of Torture on human trafficking. And Meron has a lot of knowledge about how AI systems harm refugees. They're one of the most impacted people. A lot of stuff is experimented on refugees before you see it anywhere else because they have no advocates. Um, Meron is also has a lot of firsthand knowledge about harassment on social media because she is harassed all the time. But is Meron the one getting the fame and fortune for a research on any of these things? Yes? No. <laughs> right. It's, she's not. Right? Somebody else is going to go extract her knowledge and, and publish papers and whatever. But like, that's not what, how I want to build my institute. So I want to have her as a research fellow and make sure that she gets paid whatever she needs to get paid, just like everybody else, and that her name is on, on her work. Right. So this is kind of an example I wanted to give. You know, uh, I'm going to have some tweaks on, on these slides because Twitter is good sometimes and you learn things. So Karen Howe, who is a journalist that I really, really um, admire, who used to be at um, MIT Tech Review, says, you know, when, so I want to say, why am I, why am I trying to build an independent small research institute? Why do I want more people to do that? Because she's talking about how when, when sometimes people say when these huge companies like Google or Microsoft or you know OpenAI build these huge models, these models require lots of compute power, lots of energy, lots of data, um, and 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 people are like, well, you know, we, we might solve cancer with this, with you know, cure cancer with this model, right? And she's like, why do you think that? it's okay to have these such concentrated power and to let our benevolent dictators, who are like the big tech companies controlled by a few people, why do we think uh, that that's going to uh, be saving humanity? Right? She says that on top of that, name one technology in history that has successfully been re redistributed completely equitably from the bastions of privilege and power to the have-nots in society. We've yet to achieve this with even the most basic resources like water, paper, electricity, or internet. So we, we shouldn't say, oh, hey, like, it's OK we, if we have this concentration of power, whatever, because we'll have trickle-down economics later, right? That is what all these open AI people, I'm telling you, listen to what they say literally, oh, we're going to have a techno-utopia tomorrow. But we don't even have 19th century. We're in Silicon Valley. We don't have choo-choo like trains available to everybody, right? But we're going to have a techno-utopia tomorrow. Just wait. Give me all your money and trust me with that, right? That's, that's kind of the, the, the attitude that's going on here. I, do, I don't subscribe to that. One of the things I'm thinking about 
in, in our institute is, is kind of um, what, what is the history of AI? Like how, you know, where did the money come from? What were the motivations, right? So there's a great um, article here um, called uh, Machine Translation Shifts Power. And one of the things they talk about is the history of machine translation. Um, you know, wh wh why was it because people were so interested in, you know, connecting with their neighbors and, you know, it's because, oh, Cold War, you know, we want to know what the Russians are saying, et cetera. And that's a lot of the history of AI. When you think about self-driving cars, was it because we're like, look, we want to build accessible um, cars, et cetera? No, it's like, hey, autonomous weapons. So DARPA was the one that was um, uh, funding all of these robocar, robocops, right, like for self-driving cars. So my question is, when we, you know, whenever we were thinking about technology, all these huge investments of technology, the biggest uh, sources of funding have been one of two sources, right? The military, militaristic entities interested in warfare or corporations interested in uh, profit, maximizing profit. And then, sure, they want to talk about AI for social good, right? So for me, it's kind of like, okay, let's build a tank. Let's put our, our you know, let's, make, let's um, have funding to build a tank. But then let's talk about tanks for good. Like, Let's retrofit it. Let's figure out how we can do it for agriculture. Let's figure out how, well, if that's what we want, let's not build a tank in the first place. So what does that mean? We have to think about where this funding is coming from. We have to think about how, how we're doing our whole process, right? So I guess I'm spending a lot of my time right now thinking about like all those meta questions. The problem is, while I'm doing this, whoa. <laughs> agrees, agrees. <laughs> so the issue is, look, as I'm thinking about, you know, oh, where's our little funding sources coming from, et cetera, somebody, some random institute out there is raising $500 million, right? So we're always completely behind, but we still have to kind of think about alternative futures. Um, all right, so, uh, oops, sorry. Um, okay, so this is um, kind of, some of what I'm talking about here is um, summarized in this great, um, series by, again, Karen Howe. I'm such a big fan of her. Like, I, I always try to promote her, her work as much as I can. She just came out with this series called Artificial Intelligence is Creating a New Col uh, Colonial World Order. So uh, the series is called AI Colonialism. And a big portion of this, the reason this is happening is because whether it is social media platforms that need content moderators, or large language models that need lots of people's uh, labeled data, or anything else you can imagine right now in, in, in the space of AI. It requires the labor of lots and lots of people. And these people are not adequately compensated, right? So if we go to, okay, so this is an example of a recent um, article, um, a Time article on content moderators in Kenya, right? They were working for this um, um, company called Sama, um, and that was subcontracting to Facebook and, uh, or Meta. And um, they were getting paid, let's say, maybe $5,000. You're not even, right? Um, and the way they were being treated, it was like a machine. You know, you have to make decisions on a video 15 seconds. You have to, you, you can't blink. Uh, you don't have any, imagine the, the, the mental health issues of watching horrible, horrible videos so that we, we don't get to see it, right? They're at the front lines. But they're not getting paid what they should be. If they were, do you feel, if, if we had labor practices such that each person doing this work was getting compensated what they should, do you think these companies would be rushing to scale, quote unquote, and automate so fast? They wouldn't. So I think by nature of this, it would s slow them down. Right? Then the whole ethics and everything, what, because they have to think twice about it. So in my institute, that's one, for me, like the, the reason exploitation is, is at the heart of it is because one of the biggest issues um, in AI right now is because of exploitation. We skirt around it, we write papers, whatever, but really that's at the heart of this issue. So for instance, if you think about so many startups, um, in this valley, I mean, I, probably even from Stanford, there's one, for instance, called Scale AI. Scale AI has 
raised $600 million, has 600 employees. Their model is basically kind of having data laborers, right? People who um, annotate data. They might be in Colombia. They might be people from Venezuela because they're struggling right now. They need to, to get this job. There are lots of refugees in refugee camps that are annotating data because they, they can't advocate for, for themselves. They need this work. Are they getting the $600 million? No. <laughs> They're getting paid peanuts. And that's why this, this whole thing is attractive, because you can continue to exploit people and maximize your profit. So basically, we need a different paradigm. We need a different paradigm to, of, of how we do this. And I want to uh, give you three examples of, of this different paradigm that I like. Um, so <laughs> again, Karen Howe has an example um, of um, language revitalization. So this example is um, of uh, the Maori in uh, New Zealand. So uh, the Maori were uh, in New Zealand, and they were colonized, right? And the languages were beat out of them. They, they couldn't speak their language. They couldn't, you know, uh, if they went to school, they had to speak English, etc. cetera. And um, they were working on, uh, um, uh, like an a automated speech transcription or other language technology to help with language revitalization, right? There are a lot of elders, but there are a lot of younger generations who don't, uh, who don't um, speak this language. So um, what they did was really beautiful. They had um, a competition they, uh, using their local radio station, um, and a lot of people uh, gave... Um, annotated data, so speech with the annotated text. So they can use all of this data to, to work on um, lots of language technology that they can use for language revitalization. And, um, but they did all this, and so they were super careful. They were thinking about, because they, they were infusing their values into this process. They were thinking about how they can guard the data sets, uh, right? Like they, weren't, they didn't want to just sell it to somebody. But um, after they did this, um, they got an offer from a company called Lionbridge to um, uh, buy, license their data or buy their data or something. And they said no, and they published a video describing why, why they didn't want to uh, sell this data. And they said, you know, they believe that data is a final frontier for coloni colonization. And they specifically said they suppressed our languages and phys physically beat it out of our grandparents. Um, and now they want to sell our language back to us as a service. Um, but that's what's happening. Um, just recently, after I was done with this talk, this was yesterday. Yesterday, um, the, the Lakota um, kind of uh, basically a leadership decided that they're banning the Lakota language consortium. Um, and they said, I'm going to try to read it here. Uh, and they said they are, have been doing um, an ethical work while con they've been um, continually misleading our elders to believe that first language speakers grossly are undercompensated and unattributed expertise will freely benefit our language learners. When in fact, all of those products um, are generated for sale, sale to our own people and to a global commercial audience without any provision to protect or maintain sacred stories or knowledge as an inalienable, non-transferable collective uh, birthright of our children and, and, and grandchildren, right? Do you learn about this stuff in computer science classes? Like, do you learn how to not do this kind of stuff when you're learning about natural language processing, right? So, like, that's why we need a different paradigm to make sure that we're respecting uh, communities that, that are getting extracted from. Um, there's an organization called Masakani. Um, it's a network of African researchers working on African uh, languages and the natural language processing tools for African languages. And so their whole deal is to make sure that, you know, that they take ownership of this development. Um, the second um, example I want to give you is this um, cassava disease um, diagnosis. Uh, this is by some of my uh, former colleagues at uh, Makarari University in Uganda. 
um, Ernest and his collaborators. So um, cassava is a very important crop in um, sub-Saharan Africa. It's the largest, second largest provider of carbohydrates. Um, it's a key food security crop, and it's very important right now, especially because of um, climate change. It's very important to in increase the yields because um, there's all these locust invasions and other invasions that are making sure that, that are re reducing the yield. Um, and uh, at least 80% of smallholder farmers um, in sub-Saharan Africa grow cassava. And um, the current me uh, method of diagnosing disease, like if, there's, if your cassava plant has some sort of disease, is really, really difficult. You have to send lots of um, experts far away, et cetera. So uh, my colleagues developed this um, uh, kind of uh, app to, in conjunction with farmers, to um, classify disease severity and disease incidence. Um, so here's another example. You can count pests, et cetera. Um, if I tried to do, so this, this get, comes back to why I wanted to start my own research institute. If I wanted to start to do this kind of work, and let's say I want to publish it to a conference, they'll be like, yeah, but is this a general problem? It's only a, you know, it's only a data set pr a paper. It's only application. Where's the algorithm? Whatever, right? Let's say I'm a, 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 you know, a faculty and I want to get tenure. Well, I have, to, I have to publish a lot, so I have to do what they say, and I have to uh, make the powers that be happy, right? So I can't do this kind of work. Um, under any of those paradigms. If I'm at a corporation, it's like, how is this going to make us money, right? So, so this, for me, is the reason that I wanted to create an independent institute. The last um, example I'll give you is from our institute. So this is Rasa, ja, uh, Rasa Jasafala, who is um, a, a research fellow. And she, um, she's based out of Johannesburg in South Africa. And she was born and raised in a township. And, I, I'm t and this is um, our other collaborators. But I, I'm telling you this because our project is on um, spatial apartheid. So spatial apartheid was basically a feature of apartheid South Africa where um, uh, people in, from you know, non-European roots had to live in these townships, basically. And when you look at it here, I, you might be able to tell the difference, right? On the one side, it's like huge mansions and suburbs, et cetera. And then the other, on the other side, you have these townships. And this is not in like 1991 or you know 1975. This is now. So um, here's another example. So the question is, can we analyze the evolution of spatial apartheid? How has it changed? What's going on? What are the different neighborhood makeups, et cetera, using computer vision techniques, right? Looking at um, satellite imagery and um, using some sort of segmentation, some computer vision techniques. And um, OK. So oh, sorry. I don't think you can. Well, this was supposed to be a time lapse where you can see from you know 30 years ago until now how the neighborhoods have changed. So it's, it was supposed to basically show you that you can see a change in, from these satellite images. Anyhow, if I can figure out, OK. Um, and here are some pictures, I guess, of um, satellite images from 2011 up all the way up to 2017. You can see some of these neighborhoods filling up. You don't have to, like, you can just, like, um, take my word for it. I guess I don't think everybody can see this. So, um, so what we did is we were trying to, like, basically see if we can segment out different neighborhoods, like townships or um, wealthy neighborhoods, et cetera. Um, uh, and so I'm going to skip this. But um, so if you're interested in this paper, uh, here is, it's called Constructing a Visual Data Set to Study the Effects of Spatial Apartheid in South Africa. Now, um, in this work, uh, the biggest, the most important thing to do with gather a data set. Um, if I wanted to publish that, they'll be like, oh, but it's just a data set problem. Or what's the algorithm? Like I said, these are the kinds of things you hear in this, um, in this field when you're trying to publish this kind of work. Um, the other thing that to me is very important, like I said, is that it was led by someone who did grow up in a township, so it was a very personal project for her. It's not someone who's like swooping in and studying some other community and like coming back out and getting the fame and glory for the work, right? Um, so for me, that kind of embodies what I'm uh, trying to accomplish with DARE. And I'm going to end it there.
Thank you. Oh, we have mics. Thank you so much, Timnit. Um, up next, I will invite Arafat, Leah, and Ida to the stage, and we'll have a short Q&A session. Um, you can sit, yeah, wherever you want. Um, yeah. I like your jacket. So I'll go first with the first question. And my question is, for young African girls like me and others navigating the tech space, there's often a dilemma of working for a big tech company for financial and job security, while also being too aware of, all too aware of our impact on marginalized communities. What's your advice to us as we attempt to resolve this tech ethical tension, and how do you feel about taking the risk to start your own institute um, with the tech industry? Um, that's a really good question. Um, so I think I, when we were having lunch with some students, I, kinda, I, I touched on this. So I, if I'm going to tell someone, don't work at a large tech company, I have to work on an alternative for them. I can't like be like, hey. I was in the tech industry, I made some money, now I, I'm not, like I'm doing this other thing, but you should never do that. That seems a very uh, hypocritical thing to do. So get that money, like, you know, get it. Um, <laughs> you know, it might, it'll give you an independence, but organize, you know, I think that that's what you can, you can do so much, um, for instance, I don't know if you've um, all read Ruha Benjamin's book, Race After Technology. She gives the example of Polaroid workers, uh, right? Polaroid and their relationship with apartheid South Africa. The Polaroid workers were organizing to make sure that Polaroid stopped their relationship with apartheid South Africa. And that had a lot of impact in uh, bringing down apartheid. So I'm saying that organizing is very important. So building collective power and um, and building and working on building alternatives so that everybody doesn't have to be stuck in those kinds of places. I, I want to say that what I found a lot is that many of us in the engineering fields, um, our advocacy is not necessarily um, informed by so many scholars in other fields who have been laying the groundwork. So for instance, Safia Noble, right, um, Algorithms of Oppression. Uh, she's not an engineer, right? But this is this, she's been analyzing some of these harms. Um, people in African studies, African American studies. So it's very important to build that bridge so that you know the advocacy is um, is kind of based on that groundwork. Um, Char Charlton uh, McLean has this um, CR plus DS, um, a center called CR plus DS. He wrote a book called uh, Black Software. Black Software. But um, you know these are critical race theory. <laughs> I can't even believe this whole CR. You know, it's illegal now apparently. But like you know, critical race theory and and so many so many of, of these scholars. Like so, our advocacy has to be linked with that. Otherwise, we're going to be um, advocating for representation into hostile institutions, structural you know issues uh, that we're not going to address at the structural level. Thank you so much for that answer. Ida? Um, yeah, I can go. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Arafat. I'm a master's student um, st studying computer science with African studies minor. Oh. Um, my question is that given the fact that there's so many um, different cultures on the African continent, um, what's ethical can be very subjective based on where you are. And so how do you navigate that when you're designing a research or like you're starting a company? Yeah, um, I think that there are some basic things that are just like pay people, you know what I mean? Like I think before we get to that nuance, and, and it's true, a lot of this work on fairness, for instance, has been extremely US centric, um, especially law, like the uh, dis disparate impact, like the civil rights era law, um, and so, for it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't um, cover some of the things that are so important, but 
you know, have global ramifications. I mean, outside of the African um, continent, I'm thinking about caste-based discrimination from India. And that has huge ramifications in Silicon Valley too. But none of these fairness, ethics, whatever discussions cover that. So I think there's stuff like that where you have to be super specific. Like, uh, there's no general answer. I'm an advocate for working with specific communities. Like, in this work on South Africa, I was the only non-South African person, like, because I don't have that context, right? Um, I'm doing work on um, social media harms in the Eritrean context. I'm, I feel fine working on that because I know that context. So there is this, this kind of, in machine learning, generality. You, you have one model for everything, that generalized, and I'm like totally against that. I'm, I'm not, because you have to work context by context, um, you know, community by community. But there are some huge basic issues that we have right now that um, are not like really cultural dependent. For instance, like the exploitation that I was talking about. And I think that really is at the root of so many of the issues we're talking about. But institutions don't want to say that because then they'll have to pay a lot more money. Like that, that they have to change so many of the ways in which we do things, right? So yeah. We'll have Ida and then Leah. Okay. Um. Hi, I'm Ida. Um. So I'm interested in education and technological education. So I, I guess I'm just wondering, right? The fact that we've got so many companies um, involved in unethical practices means that there's something that went wrong in teaching ethics. So how can we better integrate um, better like ethical teaching when we're now talking about education so that we can raise more ethically conscious leaders in the future? Yeah, 100%. Like I, <laughs> this is, you know, I see it as a failure of my educational system that like I didn't know about Safiya's book until later, you know what I mean? That should have been at the center of what I'm, what I'm learning about. And um, so some, especially black women, are at the forefront of changing this. So Nikki Washington has a class um, at Dartmouth uh, on identity and tech. So she goes back to, you know, Simone Brown has this book called um, Dark Matters. It's about surveillance. It talks about you know, how surveillance is tied to policing black bodies from colonization, from um, slavery till now. So she traces it back, right? And so, um, and and she said, you know, during when we didn't have tech, when we had lanterns, they had lantern laws in, in New York where you had to, you know, um, <laughs> anybody who is black, indigenous, or mixed had to walk with a lantern. That's a surveillance, right? Um, and so she traces it back to now. We need that, like, if you don't have that context and that kind of education, you, you, you're not gonna ground your ethics or whatever in, in anything real, right? I also dislike, like, let's talk about racism. Let's talk about um, specific harms. Like, ethics is so, you know, abstract, you know what I mean? I want people to learn about history, specific harms, structural um, issues, and generally, there are lots of other disciplines who have done this work. And there needs to be power that is ceded to those disciplines from the computer science department, from the engineering department. Those disciplines need to be able to, to kind of lead um, and, and people have to you know, be forced, honestly, to take these classes and, and, and engage with these disciplines. That's what I think. Because if you say we not we got to do interdisciplinary blah blah blah, and then it's like the engineers who ha like who have all the money, and the so the sociologists are just going to come as like window dressing. That's not interdisciplinary work, right? Like, and the paradigm that got us here is in the engineering domain. <laughs> like that is the wrong paradigm. So if we want to have a different paradigm, we got to look to the people who have been creating these different paradigms. I've, I can go on, like I wrote a whole, um, I have a whole talk about the, it's called the hierarchy of knowledge and machine learning and its consequences. It's about how like different, the, the, the devaluation of different kinds of knowledge, right? And the gatekeeping that goes with it. Um, and, and that's part of the educational system. Um, I talk about, you know, like feminist studies, um, feminist scholars have this um, term called the view from nowhere, 
um, it means that we learn about technology and science as if it's from no one's point of view. Oh, it's, it's, it's some truth out there. It's some tech out there. It, it's not, it has nothing to do with the values that are uh, of the person building it. It has nothing to do with the values of the society that it's in. That's how we learn about tech in general. Where, so queer, especially queer feminist studies, um, black feminist uh, scholars have critiqued this way of teaching and they call it that way, call it the view from nowhere. So the way we t learn about stuff is the view from nowhere. So listen, like there's bodies of bodies of work that address this is just kind of the will, right, of, of a department to um, prioritize that. It's easier to say, oh, hey, um, the fairness is a math thing and you just need to find the right metric and whatever, because then you don't have to, you know, do any structural really like revamping and stuff, right? And a lot of times that's what we see. I don't think my mic is super quiet here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay. Um, so during this talk so far, we've discussed the realities of the Tigray genocide going on in Ethiopia. Yeah. And we've also complemented that with, obviously, AI and the future of technology and its impact in the world. Yeah. So I'm really curious to see how you think that these two seemingly distant kind of spheres are able to intersect um, in the future, hopefully for good. Well, they intersect very much because, for instance, drones are being used in this war. Uh, but, like, uh, okay, I, I <laughs> okay I, I'm going to say a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so there is a pretty big connection with all of this because for, let, let's talk about climate change. Um, the African continent is at the forefront of the climate catastrophe, right? But this continent contributed, what, 3% of emissions? So before this war, there was already locust invasion. Um, there's a locust, in, in, in the horn right now, Kenya, Ethiopia, I don't know, is Kenya really the horn? I don't know, like, you know, Somalia, Djibouti, um, Eritrea, Ethiopia, um, even Kenya has, like, and Sudan, They there's been a lot of um, things related to the climate catastrophe, like, floods, like um, locust invasions, like drying, you know, a lot of, so any sort of issues you have, this exacerbates it. Any little land um, dispute you have, this is huge. And now we're seeing, besides Tigray genocide, we have the worst drought in 40 years in the Somali region, the worst drought in, the, uh, in Bali, in the Oromia region. So this is, and, and in Somalia too. So this is like the context under which this is happening. So now um, you have um, people, you know, the genocide and the civil war um, that accompanies it, and we have drones. People can buy drones for this war. We don't have drones to help people eat <laughs> for medical supplies. What they're being used for is warfare in a country that cannot afford to do that. Then you have refugees fleeing this war, um, fleeing the climate uh, catastrophe, etc. And then where's the next time they see drones? Fortress Europe. Um, in Libya, I mean, we have, I talk to refugees all the time in Libya who are under, like, who are going through all sorts of horrible stuff. The EU is funding, um, you know, the Libyan uh, Coast Guard to push them back. 3,000 people have died last year alone, right, in the Mediterranean because they're building fortress Europe. They have drones, they have all sorts of high-tech stuff to make, sh to keep people out. It's not to help people, whatever, it's to keep people out. Okay, then, you know, the U.S.-Mexico border, same thing. Uh, Mi gente has a really great report on the digital border wall and how high-tech it is. So we're seeing, you know, people are like, oh, techno-utopia, whatever, but where, where are we seeing these things being used? Is to, to, to exacerbate a war, you know, and so people are dying from drones, and then to keep the refugees out. So that, that's kind of, I think, to me, how it's connected. Um, if, if we're not thinking about these issues, the techno-utopia is not going to happen by itself. People who have power are going to be using everything at their disposal 
to, um, to, to, to maintain power. Like, I mean, think about it. In the African continent, like for instance, Rwanda, Morocco, the, 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 these, these countries had $50 million for the Pegasus software to, to harass journalists. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're like, the governments can pay $50 million per, you know, use of software in order to arrest citizens and journalists, right? So if you're not contending with power, you just build technology, it's the powerful people who are going to be using it to maintain the power. So I, I don't, you know, believe in what, like, techno-solutionism, whatever. You know, obviously I'm a technologist and I think we can use technology to help us, but we have to start, we have to do that. We have to start with the process. Just because you build something, it's gonna, it's, it's not gonna be used in the way that you want it to be used. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for answering that question. And I will round it off with the last question. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I've definitely taken multiple classes where we've had, we've read your papers and it's been incredible work learning from you and hearing you speak today. My last question is, after the momentum that's been created around your AI research, what excites you the most? What are you most hopeful for? Look, I mean, this generation is amazing. I mean, like, it was very different, my generation. So the kind of stuff we were talking about at lunch, you know, I'm like, People are talking about emotional labor and stuff. I didn't have those words, you know, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> neoliberal concepts of representation. Like, I did what was that? I don't even know if I knew those words when. And so, to me, I, I always love talking to um, this generation because, you know, um, I think you are ahead and a revolution is coming, let me tell you, like, it's not sustainable. Um, so that's, that's really what excites me. I see a lot of grassroots movements, like me, I mentioned Mihente, right? Like, and how um, successful they've been. I mean, there's a lot of work to do, but um, I see, look, I danced on stage, and I'm talking about AI, like, that, that doesn't happen <laughs> in general. And so, you know, that, that's what excites me. I think this generation is gonna, is, is, really, um, is really different. And so I think you guys are gonna change stuff. Thank you, awesome. <laughs> I will now hand it over to Laura. Let's give this scholar her due. Let's ovate, stand up. Thank you to Timnit. Thank you. More, more, more. Thank you. That's correct. Thank you. And not just to Timnit, but to the cast scholars. <laughs> One time for all of you, the future, the revolution. And one time for what we will all become here together, just what we might make, just what hopeful practices might come of our time here together. Let's see what the future holds. Let's make it possible. Let's organize and think together and love together. Now, I bet everyone wants a snack, right? Let's follow over to Palm Court right over here. We'll have some music and we'll share some time in community. One more time for Timnit. Thank you, thank you.